Thanks for tuning in to Look at My JPEG, the podcast that discusses NFT, DeFi, and NFT financialization. This is your host, Xerox Jose, the founder of NFT Perp. The reason why I want to do this podcast is because there's just not enough people talking about NFT financializations. In this podcast, you can expect us to invite guests that are builders, founders, even investors that are deep in the NFT financialization space. We'll discuss their story, what they're building, and how you can get involved. So, thanks for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in to episode number 23 of Look at My JPEG podcast. In this week's episode, we have a thorough conversation with our friends at Snow Genesis. Snow Genesis is building something very promising within our NFT finance space. They're creating what they call the insights layer for NFT finance by aggregating live information from top NFT lending protocols such as Arcade, NFT Fi, X2Y2, they can combine them into an easy to use real time interface. Snow Genesis will help everyone make well informed decisions regarding lending and trading decisions, whether you're a seasoned trader or an NFT noob. Thank you for tuning into this episode. All right, GM. Welcome, Chris. GM, GM, this is actually George in the Snow Genesis account, and then Chris is in his Pudgy account. Oh, perfect. Well, welcome, George, and welcome, Chris. Thank you for Thank you. tuning into the show. Yeah, yeah thanks course. for having us. Thanks yeah. for having us. Uh, 100%. Uh, well, thanks, everyone, for tuning in live. Uh, these, as always, these episodes will be recorded and uploaded to our Spotify account. Um, and today we have guests, founders and co-founders of Snow Genesis, and I'm excited to dive into a bunch of different things in NFT finance with these guys. They are data-driven, focused as a team. So uh, again, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thanks for having us. I'm excited to, to be here and, and chat with you guys. All, all right. Uh, before we dive into uh, what we, like our agenda today, maybe give us a quick intro of yourselves, uh, how did you get in crypto, and uh, just for the sake of some content, like tell us your biggest L and biggest win of NFT trading. Yeah, uh, so I'm pretty late entrance into crypto. Um, so back in 2021, I had some friends who were getting into a bunch of launches, doing a bunch of trading, started talking to me, and then I'm like, well, what is all this? What's going on here on chain? It was totally new to me. So I looked into it and, you know, I was tracked to the fact that everything was like open and all the data was permissionless. You could you could start up a node. So I set up some nodes at the point I was on a Binance smart chain um, and just try, try to like see what's going on there and uh, saw a bunch of people getting wrecked. So I started writing some smart contracts that would kind of protect you and let you kind of degen in a safer way. Uh, for example, to protect against some tokens will like kind of almost like rug even at the beginning where you can buy, but then you can't sell. To do things like you know try to sell it in the same transaction that you buy it, or like you know max you know minimize the the total tax that you pay. Uh, you can have like a check in the smart contract if you buy through it, stuff like that. I just started looking into the space and kind of like you know to me it was very interesting the fact that you could like permissionlessly program basically money, right? And I, I to me that was like kind of mind blowing. I never really explored any of that before back in you know working in Web two. So I'm like, well, this is really cool, and just got really full time into it uh, that year, and it's just been it's been a ride since. Uh, in terms of like biggest loss, uh, I don't mind this too much, but you know, for me, Goblin Town, I bought I bought low, but also bought when it was really high as well. Um, and then Art Gobblers are, are my biggest loss for sure. Art Gobblers, wow, yeah, that, yeah. That, that seems like forever ago. Um, yeah, it, 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 was, it wasn't that long ago, but it does feel like it was like years ago. But um, yeah, that that was you know, if you remember, they, they started off selling for like you know over over ten ETH. Yeah. Um, reached like almost 20. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's a crazy time. Awesome. Well, thanks for the quick background there. Yes. Um, amazing. Chris, what about you? Well, I have a similar story uh, as George. We actually got into crypto around the same times, um, you know, doing a lot of tradings. Um, I was primarily a trader myself. Um, I've done um, upward of 200,000 transactions on chains on various chains and uh, really got into crypto because of uh, various coins. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, in 2022, uh, George and I became full-time in crypto, uh, working on Web3 products, as well as doing consulting on the side. I think one of my biggest loss um, was uh, one of the coins that I trade, I, I, the thing that I shall not name. Um, essentially, uh, the contract was uh, having a block Linux, block Linux function where they just rock, rock the holder completely. Um, so ever since from that, you know, reviewing the contract, understanding the vulnerability uh, is like on top of my mind, always be careful. Um, you know, that's why I was, I was so into of, you know, anti-rocking, uh, even like Krius little block about uh, not getting rock, <laughs> how to prevent rocks from happening. Um, so yeah, that's how I got into crypto. That's amazing. And um, can you give us a little like maybe dynamics of uh, of your partnership? Like, are you guys both developers? How did you guys meet? Uh, and and then we can kind of dive into maybe the origin story of Snow Genesis. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so we met back in uh, during COVID times. And we're both working in San Francisco, and we found out about you know crypto and these launches about this you know around the same time, and we started kind of you know doing them together, uh, kind of learning about the space together, trading together, uh, building like infrastructure to like do backrunning, uh, building out like smart contracts to you know trade safer, and then in 2022 we started like looking into like what what can we build uh, in the product space that people and it's not just like trading not just like kind of zero sum. But what can we build that's in the product space that can like a lot of people can potentially use and enjoy and and, and make and make people you know either make make them more money or help them save costs right so we started looking around and we were kind of attracted to um, basically an avalanche at the time the subnets to us were very interesting this is before like l twos were really a thing um, so we you know build a product to basically kind of create like a subnet in a box right so it's Right now, there's some interesting things like in L2 space, like Conduit, that are doing that for, for on top of ETH, but we're doing it for Avalanche, right? So you can kind of come in and create your own subnet, you basically use your own VM, uh, and then you can have your own chain and you can you know determine various parameters for that. Uh, for if you have like a game, for example, uh, that didn't work out. We we tried it, but you know it, I think it was a cool product, but it didn't didn't reach any PMF and it didn't work out. Uh, so then we're kind of like looking around and just playing around in the space, and uh, we got into you know NFTs. In a, in a much deeper way, and we saw especially NFT finance being very, very interesting to us, right? So the kind of intersection of NFT and DeFi, we really liked uh, that, and we really saw, you know, as NFTs become kind of even more valuable, and as NFTs, you know, develop economies on top of them, that NFT finance will be even more uh, impactful. So we kind of got full time into that at the end of 2022, and then we launched this product as like a data layer on, in January of this year. Yeah, thanks for kind of diving into that. I think. Um, every builder uh, and, and collaborations between builders uh, go through that phase of learning process. You know, you, you have this, this initial idea, you you, uh, you test out, you, you build, and you find out uh, perhaps along the way that this is not the, the PMF that you're looking for. But the process of, of building, like the, the knowledge you acquire, the, the experience that you, you acquire kind of propels you better for the next product. And, and um, so... With regards to so Genesis, like I took a look at the website, uh, kind of play around a little bit. I love how deep and uh, data analytics uh, you guys are uh, with, with how you present information uh, and how you, specifically on the lending uh, side of it, where you guys are aggregating a lot, a lot of data on APR, loans available, it's like loan, um, like borrower, lender. I think that's part is quite interesting. Um, so maybe. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about like what drove you guys to create the data layer of NFT finance. Um, I think every every cycle and every uh, narrative uh, run within DeFi or, or in any industry in general, right? Like some companies build direct product, some companies build picks and shuffles, and I I can consider you guys more or less in that category, but where you're you're building these picks and shuffles for. Uh, people to use uh, and kind of catch that ride of NFT finance wave. Um, so yeah, tell us a little more about like, why did you guys decide um, to create this data layer for NFT finance and uh, what particular use cases have you guys 
uh, been pushing for for like the, the community members that you have or user users that you have? Yeah, so I think there's two reasons why we kind of focus on the data slash insights layer. And the first one is we saw there's a lot of information asymmetry in the space. And I think that's common with like any kind of nascent space where there's like a lot of offerings. Uh, typically, people who only use one offering and not another offering don't necessarily see everything that's available to them, right? So they may have, you know, either really high APRs or very low, you know, loan to values that they can access. And we kind of saw this and we thought, well, what if we can aggregate everything and you can see everything in one space? Whether you're a lender or a borrower, I think it's, it's very valuable to to have access to all that information. Uh, and not only that, but also kind of see like historical information uh, and see what what people are doing, what people are thinking. Um, you know, beyond even just lending and borrowing, for example, um, it's an interesting signal for trading, right? To kind of see what do lenders think about the floor rising if they don't increase their LTVs? Maybe they're not very bullish on it. Or what if you see a lot of people, you know, leveraging more into a collection? That's an interesting signal. Or what if you see people kind of hedging their downside in a collection? You can kind of tell that as well from the historical data. That's also very interesting. So to us, it's interesting because there's like the trifecta of borrowers, lenders, and traders. And the data that you can kind of understand from that is, is very interesting, but also the data that you can provide to each of those categories is also very interesting. Uh, the second reason is is like legal and compliance, right? Like the most interesting things that we want to release, we cannot release, right, in the U.S. We have to be very careful with that. Uh, we do have some very interesting protocols in mind that we think are very cool, um, but we've held off on actually releasing them because, you know, that there's like a, basically risk we do not understand, right? And we don't want to, we're not able to navigate that as a very small company. Um, so we are thinking of releasing a, maybe a protocol in, in the sense of, um, you know, kind of a prototype, like code that people can like look at and, and think about and have a discussion in the community because basically we want to protect both borrowers and lenders, right? So we see that like one mistake can basically wipe out all your profit if you're a lender or it can wipe out you know, like your NFT collection if you're a borrower, right? For example, things that don't make sense to me are like, you're like five seconds late, one block late to pay back your loan and then you lose your entire, entire asset. If you come from like a, a background in like real life, like it makes no sense, right? Like if you miss a car payment or you're day late or you miss like a mortgage payment, they don't come and take your car or your house. Like you, you have time to pay it back. You can pay some fees. So the fact that it's all a binary outcome is something that is a, is a solvable problem, right? And if it's going to scale, like it has to, these things have to be fixed. And we have protocols that we've kind of like prototyped and created like in-house, but we haven't released that can solve a lot of these things. So we were data layer first, but we're also kind of want to, you know, maybe build some things that are public good, like fully trustless and permissionless protocols that can protect borrowers and lenders, right? And on the lender side, we see people, um, for example, make some offers that are stale, and then we see the floor decline very quickly, and then some borrowers take advantage of that and almost arbitrage those offers by buying low on Blur OpenSea and then selling into a collection offer on one of these loan protocols that's actually higher and make an instant profit. Uh, that can all be protected too, right? That would wipe out some lenders' um, interest that they've earned over months, can be wiped out in a few seconds. So both sides can be can be helped and we kind of want to make the space better by making it safer for everybody. So that's why like we kind of data first. That's quite- And I'll let Chris jump into if you want. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Yeah. A lot to unpack on the this like protocol that you have mentioned. So uh, in, in theory, like how do you uh, in, in practice, like how do you protect? Uh, how do you protect the, the borrowers, uh, and how do you protect the lenders? Do you have like a is it like a liquidity tranche or a pool where it does those things for you for, for borrowers? Like if you miss if you miss like a, a payment, like do borrowers opt in for, for some kind of protection, and then the, that liquidity pool is gets deployed when those things happen, and and how does the lenders actually get protected? Um, feel free to share information if you want. <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. No so, hypothetical, right? Definitely love to. <laughs> yeah, hypothetically speaking. Uh, so what you mentioned is really, really cool, and I think long-term we'll see insurance plays like that. Uh, but the first thing we have in mind right now is something even simpler, right? It's something that is like less than 100 lines of code. Uh, it's fully trustless. There's no admin. Um, and basically, a borrower can approve the borrower note onto this contract, and it lets the contract control basically the, uh, the escrowed asset, right? So basically, if the borrower doesn't pay it back, uh, before that, they can set a parameter, you know, a certain amount of time before the loan is due. They can say, I want to start an auction, right? And then people can come in and bid on that item and then buy it out before. And then, for example, like we see like someone's Fidenza worth like 60, 70 ETH. They had paid 29 ETH. Uh, they had a 29 ETH loan, 
right? And they weren't able to pay it back this time. In this case, because they didn't have the cap, the cash flow. Uh, if you started the loan right before it was due, um, you know, you can see a lot of people would be willing to bid on that because you can immediately flip it on, you know, OpenSea for like 65 ETH at that time. Uh, or if you obviously you can keep it too, uh, but that would pay back the borrower. I'm sorry, that would pay back the lender, right? And the delta would go to the borrower, right? So instead of losing out on all that asset about minus the the borrow amount, you kind of get back that delta from the bid amount minus the borrow amount. So that can all be done trustlessly. That was established at auction on chain. Um, so that yeah, if you want to do you want to talk about that, or I can move on to the lender. No, no, no this too. is incredibly interesting. This is essentially uh, building the auction uh, liquidation process for. Like protocols like NFT Pi, because they don't have that, uh, or any protocol exactly. that don't have liquidation process, right? Because the the lenders uh, are get, essentially getting these uh, at a, at a discount, if you will. Um, exactly. Yeah, uh, it's like an optional. You know, like lenders, like a lot of lenders make a lot of money from you know basically loan to own, um, and I think it's been great for them up to now. But like, if the space is to grow. Uh, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but when, when it does happen, it's big news and it makes the space look really bad. And like people don't want to, they don't want to risk their asset, right? Like they don't, they don't want to come in and, and borrow against it if there's a chance of this happening. So any kind of protections there, I think, are just going to be make the space like much more attractive to new entrants. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. Cool. And and for for the lenders, like, what does that look like? Yeah. So for lenders, um, if you're like your kind of your own your own shop as a lender. Um, I think following best practices is very important. Like, you wanna you wanna use the SDK, and then you wanna you wanna have like very short term offers. For example, uh, like one hour offers, and then you'd redo them every hour. Um, this kind of protects you from a very fastly declining floor. Um, also, keeping in keeping on top of every collection that you're lending against, if you're if you're like an automated bot creator, is very difficult, right? Like even two days ago, there was a contract called the ETH Lizards, and they moved to like a V2, and uh, basically. Uh, some people, you know, took advantage of the floor declining for V1 and then dumped on some unsuspecting lenders, mm. right? And if you're able to, like, plug into some API that kind of tells you, uh, you know, real-time risk factors and you can, like, adjust your offers or cancel them um, in real time, that's very helpful. Other lenders, you know, making use of things like Spice Finance or Metastory is very useful if you don't want to have to stay on top of everything. You can kind of, you know, defer to a liquidity scaling solution like that. And other lenders, you know, that we've seen be very successful are like fully manual lenders, right? Like very kind of relationship-driven lenders like uh, Cyrus from Mumbo Labs, you know, very on top of a certain set of subset of collections, really understands the trades and understands the values and the premiums beyond the floor. Mm. Uh, and is also able to kind of manually manage his risk. So those are kind of the three types. And uh, for uh, Linda's side, Linda's side, it's mainly about like best practices and, you know, how to, how to kind of be safe and have good offers. Yeah. How did you, just curious, um, how did you come across these insights? Is this the repetitions of being a power or lender, or or do you talk to your potential customers, and or is that are these insights sort of discovered from the data that you guys have been pulling? Both the data and also Chris is very plugged into all these communities. I'll I'll let him jump in. He's like an expert on this. <laughs> I'm not an expert, but um, I am just allergic to um, problem that don't have solution. Every problem have you know, some sort of solution that you can go into. So I'm very plugging into uh, various lending protocol and understanding what uh, the lenders of ours are facing um, in terms of their challenges. And I use those learning to, um, you know, discuss internally to see how a Synogenesis as a company, can we help our lenders and borrowers and to grow the space as a whole. Um, Love that. Um, besides the borrower and lender protection, um, the, these protocols, uh, what other low hanging fruits have you guys been sort of like tinkering around with? And are there any high, other hypothetical uh, products you guys have been wanting to release, but due to regulatory reasons, you haven't? Yeah, so actually what's, what's really cool, I think, is the protection for the borrower is is actually more than just that, right? Like it allows you to do something like a loan to sell, right? The kind of the inverse of buy now, pay later. What if you have like a grail that you don't want to sell immediately or it takes some time to, to sell? Um, you can take out a loan and, and then, you know, start an auction afterwards, right? You can get in initial capital and then let the auction run for some, you know, seven days or whatever. Um, and that's the same exact principle as the protection for the borrower that we talked about. The same exact protocol could do that, right? So then kind of the, the constraints there is, you know, the distribution, right? Like where are you able to see that that, that borrower node is being you know, sold. Now, where is that, you know, where is that available? And right now, you'll see it like in the borrower node NFT collection, which doesn't make any sense, right? Like it should really appear 
under the same collection that the asset is in, right? Like basically any kind of like service like OpenSea and Blur in the future, I think they're going to have to treat them the same and say, hey, this is actually a borrow note, but really it's the item. So transparently and atomically, when you buy it, it would convert it, it would pay it back the lender and then you'd get the asset, right? So that's kind of like, I see that happening in the future, but that's kind of reliant on kind of the, the platforms that have distribution, have users and, and a long tail of, of people accessing and trying to buy. Uh, but in the interim, like if you have a site for auctions, it could be very interesting, right? Like what if you get to see all the auctions happening across like Bendao, uh, JPEG, uh, et cetera, but also you could see auctions happening because people want to auction their item off while they're getting a little bit of capital because it happens to be a grail that's harder to flip. So yeah, that's actually the same the same underlying protocol. Got it. Uh, and on Snow Genesis, I know you guys have data on trading, you have data on lending, loan offers, and, and also uh, you know some, some metrics for, for borrowers as well. Uh, are these sort of like collateral loans? These notes is that something that you guys are looking to integrate as well on your platform? Like the market for them. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the last part of the question? I couldn't. Hear. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned like more, more or less on on these transparency of, of different collaterals, right? Like, like the the protection group we've already talked about. Like, are these data uh, something that you guys are looking to also integrate integrate on um, on Stone Genesis platform? For the protocol that we talked about, yeah. that's just like hypothetical, um, something that we think would be really cool for the space. Yeah. Uh, but we can't release it ourselves. Got it. Okay. Very interesting. But if someone were to release that, we would integrate it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's quite interesting. Um, so just for some context, like NFT Perp, uh, it, the whole platform that we're running right now, it's entirely cash settled, but we do have interest to explore into the lending and borrowing side of things, you know, not, not directly competing with anybody, uh, if you will, because I think, uh, it, the space is relatively saturated in NFT finance. Um, but that also, like you mentioned, it, it allows you. Uh, as builders or different um, people that see these different problems to create solutions around them. And we're, we're, we're very interested in exploring sort of filling the gap between um, different NFT lending and borrowing protocols like around aggregation. Uh, I noticed you guys have an aggregator on your platform that aggregates all of the different available uh, loans, um, offers across NFT lending and borrowing protocols. Um, Something that's quite interesting, and I have been thinking about this for quite some time, um, is the idea of aggregation, because I think Llama Lend is probably the only other one that I've seen that aggregate all these different data uh, on available loans and offers across lending and borrowing protocols. But it seems like there's no one single front end to take out loan or lend out uh, in energy finance at the moment. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, one thing we really want to release, but we kind of held back, is an execution layer, right? So be able to, you know, act on the data that we have and be able to, you know, see all these listings and offerings and either borrow or lend against them on one platform. So you could submit all your offers on here, or you could accept multiple ones um, on Stone Genesis directly. That's something that we're kind of working. We have internally, but we haven't released, you know, because until we have like a better, clear understanding of like the legal risk of that, we don't want to push that out. But like, here's what we were thinking in three months if we're able to release something like that, right? Like, we one platform like this where you can see you know loans, but you, all, you can also see you know spots, but you can also see like the derivatives, right? Like, you, you have one account on ETH, and then you're able to buy something on you know go, you can go long or short NFT perp with that one account. Like, imagine like the execution layer would have a relay built in. And you could access that, you know, whether it's an arbitrum or where it is, on through once. So that's like aggregating the NFT liquidity. Something that's very interesting to us. Uh, whether we release it to a pub publicly or not is what we're building internally right now, actually. Got it. Okay, super interesting. I would love to, when, when we're done with the episode, love to hop on an additional call and you can chat. Now. Oh, potentially with a couple of Um Yeah, this is this is great. Um, any other interesting thing? Like, I I love to take a little little segment, if you will, and this is something that new that we're doing on, on this podcast. Uh, we'll call it glass half full and glass half empty uh, regarding a specific topic within NFT finance. So in your idea uh, or in your mind, what do you think of NFT finance right now in a glass half full type of mentality? Uh, you said, what do I think about NFT finance in a glass half full? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. 
Um, I think the pros are being able to access liquidity without having to incur a taxable event mm -hmm. and be able to you know, have an asset that instead of lying fallow, you can, you can get some capital on. I think that's, that's a very, very cool um, unlock. And what do you think of the entire sort of NFT finance space right now in terms of liquidity and dynamics between protocol? Uh, what's, what's a glass uh, half empty type of uh, take you have? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think, I think like, as we talked earlier, kind of the, the, the binary outcomes mm -hmm. of being able to just make one mistake and then you get wiped out, whether you're a borrower or a lender. Um, I think it's because, you know, protocols are, it's still a very new space, right? So some of the protections are not built in, but also I think in crypto, you know, we all kind of, a lot of people kind of take this viewpoint where, oh, well, you know, it's in the code, you knew about it, it's kind of your fault thing. Yeah. Um, you know, instead of saying, well, wait a minute, like, if you want to, if you want to like, if you want to make the space to 100x bigger, like you have to kind of deal with these things, right? Like you have to protect people from their own mistakes yeah. um, and give them all those options. And they don't have to take them, but the, the options should be there. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of like the glass half empty part. Yeah. Like the fact that a lot of people don't really care or don't think too much about mm -hmm. it, or maybe it's not top of mind, you know? And that to me makes sense from, from the perspective of, okay, yeah, it's crypto, but from the perspective of growth, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. I, I, think, I think these sort of things takes iteration. Um, for for protocols and, and, and different communities to come to a realization that these need to be improved and and that sort of prepares you for the next uh, wave of, of adoption, if you will, or or, or volume or usage uh, across protocols. Uh, awesome, thank you for the take on that. Um, I guess besides like what we've discussed so far, is there anything that I missed uh, that Stone Stone Genesis is really focusing on that we should be speaking about? Um, Chris, do you want to hop in? Yeah, you have covered a, a lot already. I think, um, yeah, the education layer that we are pretty excited about, um, that we're building in-house. However, um, if if possible, yeah, we would love to release it to the world and uh, have people use it. But, you know, something that we still have to take legal compliance into consideration. Yeah. Got it. Um, how long have you guys um, been working on Snow Genesis and like sort of what's the next steps for you guys? What does the roadmap look like? Um, and how much users, listeners uh, get involved? Yeah, so we started building our Snow Genesis in November of 2022. And uh, we were building our um, blockchain indexer, uh, data pipeline, and just our own, own infrastructures. And we uh, sort of got into uh, lending um, around December. And we in January 2023, we officially um, alpha launch our product. And uh, our future roadmaps, uh, like we mentioned, like working on the execution layer and potentially building protocol, um, internally um um yeah and then we're and then mainly we're just uh focusing on um really growing out the team uh, because there are so many protocols out there um that have discoverability issues um uh, with our platform currently support uh, the top lending protocol uh, like rk and ntfx 2 by 2 bendao and delta um, but there are so many protocols out there that, you know, need discoverability. We want the lenders and borrowers to have um, the complete picture before they make any decision. So uh, we'd love to support them uh, more and more protocol in the near future as well. Got it. Yeah. Thank you, so, thank you guys so much. Um, well, George and Chris, um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you guys. I'm excited about what you know, Genesis has been up to and what you guys are releasing next. Um, Listeners, uh, go follow Snow Genesis on Twitter. That's at 0x Snow Genesis. Um, and also Chris um, on Twitter as well, if you're uh, here uh, on listening to the recording. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, is there anything, anything uh, I guess, like leaving words for uh, the audience?
Yeah, thanks for having us. It was great chatting uh, with you guys. And yeah, I look forward to, to, to chatting more in the future about NFT perp. I think it's really cool what you guys are building on, on Arbitrum uh, as well. Appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Well, thanks for coming on again. Um, I'll see you guys next time. Okay, see you guys. Bye. See ya. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to Welcome at JPEG Podcast. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your audio podcast from, give us a like, a subscribe if you like the content, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.